Hi there, my front end friends. The other day, somebody on my Discord server asked me if I'd ever noticed the hover effect on the Windows security menu, and I'd never even bothered to take a look at it, so I decided why not go check it out if it looks cool, and, and yeah, damn, that, that looks pretty cool. So naturally, I wanted to see if I could recreate it using HTML and CSS, and I figured this one would probably need a little bit of JavaScript as well. So I spent a ton of time trying to get this effect to work, and the initial glow where it just moves around and follows the mouse is actually really easy to do, but it's that corner effect where the adjacent elements are getting the glow on them as well. That was a little bit trickier and something that I struggled with a little bit. I ended up taking several different solutions. I got something that worked, but I wasn't happy with it. I kept hacking away at it. I spent a lot of time time on it. And then when I was done with it, I was super proud of myself. I thought it would make a fantastic video, but I shared a preview of it uh, over on Twitter and in my Discord and stuff. And then somebody said, oh, that's cool. That looks a lot like that effect from that Hyperplex video. Wait, what? So naturally I had to go and look and, oh yeah, there it is. Here we have a multi-card spanning hover effect, where not only do you have the glow effect that's following your mouse, but the border is lighting up on the current card and on the neighboring cards as well, despite what you might think. And of course, as you'd expect from Hyperplex, he did a fantastic job of explaining how to do it. And at first, this really sucked. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on this, though I did have a bit of fun doing it. Uh, but it was, you know, there was a frustrating experience trying to go through the different iterations that I, to get to where I eventually went. And then I had this cool video idea, but then I couldn't do the video because I don't want to be copying something else that somebody else already did and probably did better than me. But then I got to thinking a little bit, and while I could have just recreated the effect in, what, 10 minutes watching his video and figuring out how he did it, I learned a lot more by trying to do it and failing on my own. And by going through the entire process, I also learned, like, a ton of stuff. I'm like, you know, I wasn't, I got it working, but I wasn't happy with that solution. Then I tried something else. I ran into problems with that. And in the end, I'm actually really happy that I did it on my own first. And then, interestingly enough, when I looked at Hyperplexed video, he took a completely different approach than I did. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I shared it on Twitter at one point, and then Tamania Fifth of CSS Challenges fame took his own approach at doing it, and he shared his solution, which was actually completely different from both of ours, and actually did something I never even knew was possible, which was really cool, and I learned even more from that. And then after deciding I was actually going to make this video where I was going to explore not only how I managed to do it, which we're getting to, I promise, sorry for the long intro, uh, but as I was going through the steps of doing this and breaking down the differences in their approaches to my own, I came across another one by Jay, and Jay took a different approach as well. We have four different ways of doing the same thing, which is part of the fun of web development, and I think something we can learn a lot from. So the reason we have this long intro here is to say this video is not going to be a how-to in the classic sense, but that first of all, the, the main lesson is that reinventing the wheel is not a waste of time because you can learn a ton from it. And I wanna share with you the different approaches that I took to get to my final version, the problems I had with the early ones, the things that weren't working and all of that. And then once we get to my finished version, we're gonna compare it to the other people's and see what they did differently. You know, maybe get some clever ideas from some of the things they did that work better than my own. And at the end, I'd love it if you could let me know in the comments which of the different approaches you actually liked the best. So let's dive into the code and look, and we're gonna break things down in the different steps I did, including the failures, like I mentioned. Uh, but the very first thing I wanted to do, and the first thing when I'm doing anything is going for easy wins. And the easy win for me was the background glow that's on here. Uh, and you'll notice it's the same on all of the different cards and it just follows my mouse wherever it is. And I just did that by having a background image that's a radial gradient uh, and the center of the circle would be at the X and use the Y there uh, as custom properties. And then I just used uh, JavaScript to, you know, nothing too fancy here to track the positioning of my mouse uh, as it moved around. And the real trick for that was then just on this to only have that show up on hover. <laughs> and by doing that, uh, the only card that will show the glowing effect is the one that we're hovering on. And yeah, that, that actually worked pretty well. And I, I was happy with that. And that was that first step down where I was like, I'm making great progress here and um, it's gonna be super easy going from this step on. Uh, but then things got tricky when I was trying to get that intersection area. And I think one of the reasons for that is actually the approach I took here sort of gave me a, a false sense of how I should have been thinking about this entire thing. So my, and my first idea for this actually, I think would have worked. Um, I was just lazy and didn't want to do the math for it because what I was originally thinking was I should just give all of these cards a border. And by doing that, then I could actually just use a mask to hide the parts of the card I was going over. 
But just like we saw when I wasn't doing the card hover, the issue I ran into here was the way I was tracking my X and the Y position. It's the same on all the cards. So my mask kept like resetting when I'd go on to a second or third card. And that's just because of the way I was tracking this. I'm always getting like the top right of whatever card I'm on, but it just meant that it wasn't this like global area that I was masking out. And I think then what I could have done is actually track things more independently um, instead of tracking them on each one and I wouldn't have run into this problem. So my first thought was actually this one where you can see it's working uh, and I was really happy with this. I got something that, that functioned, but I really didn't like my solution here because if we come and take a look at it, I have um, my grid container, my grid, and then I have my cards on there, which you'd expect. That's nice and easy. Uh, but then when we go all the way down, then I did this other grid down here and I have a second grid that's overlaid on top of the first one. And the whole idea with this one is uh, what I'm doing is I'm keeping track of the mouse position. Uh, but you'll notice I was doing it separately for the uh, cards themselves and then for the entire border. And then I was had different properties going on here, which I, I was sort of overcomplicating it in that sense because I don't think I needed to bother with that. Um, but the idea was I was had like two separate things going on. And if we come and take a look down in my CSS, I had this border mask, which was actually using like a mask here with a radial gradient, uh, which you can do. Um, I have lots of videos on masking and I knew this was sort of the way I wanted to go. And this was a proof of concept more of anything, uh, the way I did it. And I'm like, cause you know, duplicating, you know, having a whole bunch of empty stuff in your HTML is not the way to go. And I knew that, but I just wanted a proof of concept that I was pretty sure would work. So here, if I actually take this transparent part off of my mask and I just make it white and the color here doesn't matter, just about the opacity that's in there. So even if I did red, you can see the borders are showing up on all of them. Uh, and it's actually sort of fading out a little bit closer to my mouse, which is the transparency here. Uh, and then I just have, I did the same trick. I had my grid container hover. So if I hovered on my container, uh, the borders would show up. So all my borders turn on as long as I'm hovering on top of the parent. Uh, and then I had the mask that was coming here. And of course this was set to transparent to parent uh, to hide the bits that I didn't want to actually be showing. Uh, there we go, transparent, spell properly. And now you can see that it's working. And the other part that was important here was the pointer events of none, uh, just so I can actually like, I think it allowed me, I think it needed that anyway. I put that on there for a reason. Um, Cause I think without it, yeah, without it, nothing worked. You can see actually the highlight up here in the top corner uh, is showing up. And that's just because of the way um, it was tracking the mouse position. Uh, because I had this, I was using grid to overlay the two containers. So I was always getting the mouse position that it was on top of there and that was causing me problems. So pointer events, none just meant that the mouse tracking wasn't looking at my border mask at all, which was on top and it was causing all of the issues. Now, I really wasn't happy with that idea of having to duplicate the HTML and have something like this that seemed really silly. And I said, well, if I'm already using JavaScript, I guess the easiest thing to do in this case uh, would actually be not to bother doing that. So you can have this completely empty and have nothing in there. Uh, and then I could use my JavaScript to come in and actually just add those, like add it all in. Um, so for here, I get each card, I would create a new div, and then I had my border container uh, that got created too, that had the class uh, grid on it with the border mask. All the things I needed were there. So all this extra stuff, I was just using JavaScript to append it and throw it in there. So it is in the DOM, but at least you don't have to worry about it when you're writing your HTML. Still though, like I was like, oh, okay, that works, but it's a little bit sloppy, right? Um, do I really wanna go down that road? And at this point I needed to take a break. And I think if ever you're trying to do something and you're not happy with your solutions and maybe it's just not working at all, or you tried something, it works, but you know there's a better way to do it, take a break because you get so stuck in how you're trying to do it. And that's definitely where I was at uh, that I sort of wasted some time just trying to sort of force things to work. And I took a break and it was the best thing I could have done um, because when you take a break, you come back to it a little bit, you're a bit more fresh and you think about the problem a little bit differently. Sometimes you even think about the solution while you're away. Uh, this, this time it didn't happen, but I came back to what I was working on and I decided the problem that I was doing is I was doing something individual for all of them and it would make much more sense to try and have one global thing that I could move around. Uh, but I was struggling with that. I was trying a few different things and the positioning and I, getting it to be in the right place just was really difficult, probably because I didn't know what I was doing and didn't I, I couldn't come up with a good solution. But then for whatever reason, I said it'd be nice if it, I could still use a, a gradient with a background image would sort of be the best way to do it, I think. But 
if they all had the same background image and I was trying to come up with like a masking way. I, I didn't save this one because it was a disaster, but I had like a grid set up where I was trying to use a gradient of a mask to make boxes where I wanted it to show up. It was, it was a complete disaster. Uh, and then I had this like flash of an old lesson I used to teach back when I was teaching in school. And I was looking through all my files. I actually had to pull out my old hard drive that I backed everything up when I was teaching uh, from a box that I had. And I, I found the file that I was looking for and I'm gonna share it with you. Okay, and here's the example of what we were working on. Let me move my face out of the way a little bit. And it was this simple thing. I have the code right here for it where it was to teach students um, how to uh, come in with background images on things. And so, or here I have the flowers on there too. Um, but it was just like make the background of the entire page a seamless repeating pattern, uh, a blue background on this one, a green background here, red to blue gradient, an image of a cute cat as the background, different things just to get them used to using it. And then there was a bonus at the end. And so, you know, they, it was nothing too fancy, uh, but I just wanted to get through the practice of learning the different background stuff. And we'd learned all of this along the way, but it was sort of, a, you know, let's approach, you know, just explore background images a little bit. Uh, but the bonus at the end is the fun bit. And so what I the first part of the bonus is all of the same, the same image for all of them. And one of the reasons I did this is just to remind people they can use element selectors uh, instead of having to select everything. Um, not that it's best practice to select a div uh, and put background images on that, but uh, background image, we can come on there. Um, and in this case, I had the uh, uh, images and then a dog.jpg, and we could get this dog that shows up on all of them, but you know, whatever, not too, not too exciting when you do that. Um, and just because it's a background image, it repeats and all of that. But the second part was to give them a background attachment of fixed. And this is the fun bit. And I came up with this and I added this later on to this lesson because uh, I remember coming across this and being like, that's super cool. I wanna make sure I'm showing it to my students. Uh, so it was background attachment of fixed. And then you get this interesting thing that comes in where it looks like the image is crossing over the different divs. Uh, and then this gets even more interesting if we come in and we add in a background back back, got to spell things right, background uh, size of cover. And if we do that, like it's one big image shared across the whole thing. Let's make this padding like 200 pixels or something just so, you know, you get this. And this is the effect that everybody knows with background attachment fixed. And the reason this is working is when you use a background image, what's actually happening, or sorry, when you use a background attachment of fixed, it's positioning it according to the viewport rather than positioning it according to the div. So these are still two separate background images, both positioned basically one on top of each other related to the viewport. And it make, gives you this effect uh, that it, it's one big image effectively. It's almost like a window between them all, right? And if we made this bigger, I don't know, 100 pixels between each, you still get that same like windowed effect, which is really cool. And you often see this with one image for this sort of fake parallax effect, but you don't get it across multiple ones. And even on iOS, on like Safari and stuff, the positioning of it is the same. The only thing is it won't scroll. It won't be static when you're scrolling. The image will scroll off. But as far as positioning it, the initial positioning of it will actually be the same, uh, if I remember correctly anyway. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I've tested that out. Positioning is the same. It just scrolls off when you scroll. And so with that <laughs> and remembering this and being like, yes, I knew I had something like this. And it, it took me a long time to actually find uh, that I probably could have come up with a solution in the amount of time that I ended up digging out that hard drive uh, and remembering where I had it. But with that out of the way, I actually came up with a better solution. And so what I did is I came up with this one here where on an after, so just on each card after, I put in a background image to be a radial gradient and I had it tracking the mouse position just like we saw before. Uh, but, and this is the original problem I had and I went through so many different iterations trying to solve this, but you'll notice that I'm getting like the same gradient across all of them. And this was the problem is the positioning of that gradient was the same and I'd get this happening. So uh, when I, 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 I'll show you how we did the corner effect after, but the problem is, well, the positioning of it's way off because I'm tracking it on my screen right now instead of on the right spot. But um, the, the issue would be like, as it would go into the corner, I'd be highlighting this corner and this corner and this corner over here. But by coming and using a background attachment of fixed on here, it means the background image, even though it's a gradient, it's fixed for all of them to the viewport. And this is like, 
just by doing that, look, it just follows my mouse and it goes across the different elements and it's so cool. And I was so excited that this actually worked because I honestly wasn't sure if it would with a radial gradient like this. And then I could track this with the X and the Y and it worked perfectly fine uh, and, and just is super nice. So you just track your mouse position and follow it around. Uh, and then to actually just get it to be the corners, all I needed to do then is to put it in the back. So we could use a Z index of negative one to push it backwards, which of course would then make it disappear. This is the original glow that we saw before. And then on my inset, I just do a negative one or a negative two pixels or however thick I want that border to be. Uh, and then you can see it's act two is probably a bit too thick, but it gives you an idea and you can see it showing up. We'll go back to one. Um, and then the effect actually starts working and you can see that that gradient so it's behind the cards and because it's a background image on the cards I don't have to worry about the empty space in between them with having like a, you know if we had one big glow then we have to figure out how to hide it in those areas and only have it on the corner so it's you know this it's a the gradient like we saw before it's it's like the big glow but anyway I was super happy that that worked um, and at this point I had like a X glow and the Y and X right here. Then realizing how well this worked, I realized I didn't actually need to track and, and do two different things. We could do the entire thing with the same coordinates, uh, across both of them. So the same, you know, I don't have to worry about trying to like track different things because everything just used the same positioning. Uh, and it's a little bit stronger, I guess, than the Windows security one, uh, but it worked and I was super happy. And that was my solution. So if we just come really quick to look at the JavaScript, it's really, really simple. I'm just tracking the positioning, adding pixels to it basically, and assigning that to the X and the Y and it works and I'm super happy with it. And then the card hover was that background gradient. I ended up using the fixed on this one as well, just to get it so I could be using the same thing because basically I have two overlapping gradients at this point and that's why I could use the same gradient, uh, the same X and the Y for both of them. Um, so I used the same trick for both. This is the background of the card itself that highlights as I'm hovering over and it only shows up to match the way the window security worked. And then I have the card after that's showing up. I'm putting it behind instead of negative one. So it's sticking out and giving me the border effect. Um, I think right now I always have it tracking. I could, well, I think it's kind of cool that even if I'm off of it, um, it still works. So uh, but you could track it like I'm tracking across my whole page probably. Uh, yeah, on my entire document. So um, yeah, I'm tracking across the entire document. Maybe I could just track it if I'm on top of that element or something. But the, the gist of it is that. But of course, that's not the end. That's how I got from where I started to where I finished. And now let's see these other solutions that other people had as well. And we'll start with Hyperplex since he's the one who originally did this as far as I know. So here it is. Um, and it's the same idea. He had a different inspiration, but um, if you watch his, he found it on a website. And of course the links to all of these code pens and his video will also be linked in the description, um, but it's the exact same effect. Um, and the border radius is here shouldn't cause a problem on mine, but the exact same effect going on. You'll notice actually it's a little bit thicker here on one side. I had the same thing. It's just cause I am zoomed in a little bit uh, on code pen cause I'm doing that to make the code a little bit bigger uh, and you get fun sub pixel rendering issues when you zoom in on stuff. Um, but yeah, let's, let's dive in and see how he did it, which was actually, um, sort of the idea that I had at the beginning that I just thought would be more complicated than it actually was. Um, so he's tracking things more on each card rather than tracking it, uh, like I did where it's like the bigger picture for every single card, he's setting a separate X and Y. So the mouse X and Y for each one of them is actually different. Whereas for mine, it was the same for each one, which is why I was running into problems. Um, so if we look in the dev tools really fast here, I know it's a little bit small, we'll zoom in a little bit, but we can see each one of them has separate X and Y. So it actually works properly uh, across his. And when I was trying to use the same one, that's where I was banging my head against the wall. I was getting it where it was not working properly. And again, for whatever reason, I thought, you know, this would be more complicated than it was. Turns out it's really nice and easy and it's a nice clean solution. Uh, and other than that, actually, he followed a similar approach than I did. I think he used different gradients. So he has the gradient here with the Z index of one. He has the before that he has a different gradient on with a Z index of three. And then I think he has the content itself. So his does have an extra level of like he has a card and then he has the card content. And he's just using that to be able to layer the different things. Whereas I have the negative Z index, which can technically get you into trouble. Um, depending on like where you're using things because you could lose it behind another background. So maybe this is a little bit cleaner in that sense as well. Um, but it just does mean you need a, you know that extra little bit of markup, which probably not the end of the world most of the time. Um, but yeah, very similar idea. We're layering the different things. Um, I think he probably could have got away with having the 
one of these not being a pseudo element and just doing it as you know the the inner one just being the gradient on the card itself but it doesn't change anything at the end of the day um i'm i use pseudo elements on everything so i get why he did it that way uh the next one here is tamanese which just blew my mind this so same type of idea you can see i put in like a, a different background just so we can see that it works um and i'm gonna go view source code on this one which the reason this one was crazy uh, he did have several different, or uh, he had two different ones. You can see this one is the Hover Effect 2. Uh, and the reason that he had more than one approach on this was just because one of them wasn't cross-browser compatible. Um, it would have only worked in Chrome or Chromium browsers, I believe. Uh, but same idea, we're tracking the X and the Y. But in this case, it was similar to me, where we're just doing it for the entire uh, section. So as long as we're hovering on the section. Um, so that did mean that they're all getting the same... Um, X and Y. So you can see here the X and Y are being tracked a singular one, not a different one for each one, which is how I was doing it, and but different to how Hyperplex had done it. Uh, but where the magic of this one happens is this part here with mask composite, which I don't even know what that is, um, or I found out now. Um, but you'll see there's a max composite of Zor, and then there's a max composite of Exclude. Exclude is the one that is more compatible with other browsers. Uh, this one is Chrome only, I believe, or Chromium only. And what he actually has is two different gradients on here, uh, which is the crazy bit. <laughs> and I, I honestly didn't even know you could do this. It makes sense. I think I even did this. I did a whole series of stuff on masks. Uh, and so I think I knew you could put two. But what he's doing is he's using the same gradient twice, but one of them is set to the padding box. And what that means is one of them stops at the padding box and the other one doesn't. So if I put the border here at five pixels, um, the five pixels extra there, you can see it's actually making it five pixels bigger. And so this is really what's controlling the size of the, the, the edge. And what the exclude here, let's turn these off for a second. And we'll see how this works. Uh, hit run, because he doesn't have it auto compiling. It looks like one single gradient, but we have two overlapping gradients right now. And what this is doing is it's saying that for, we're excluding basically, uh, it, it, it's only including the overlapped section for I think the first one here, which is set to the padding box or vice versa or whatever, you know, I have to play around with this a little bit more, but basically it's tracking around and it's only showing us the outer area where these are not overlapping. So the area that's overlapped is excluded and the area outside of that, which is our border here because of the padding box setting. Uh, so one of them is stopping at the padding box. The next one goes out into the border box, uh, which is just really cool. And he does have another gradient for the inside here. And I think because of how we set this up, he did say he had an extra span um, which, you know, if we come and take a look, we have the div and then we have this floating span here. I'm not sure if you could replace that with a pseudo element. I didn't dive into it and play around with it too much. And here, just to show you, like here we had the div before and then div span before. If I leave these ones alone, but I come to just this one and I change the color of the gradient, uh, you can see it's only doing that outside gradient is actually switching colors. Uh, of course, we don't want to do that because they all show up and it breaks the entire thing. But just to show you, we have like several different gradients going on here as well. But anyway, really cool solution. Probably, again, this is linked down below if you want to explore this more. I'm not deep diving exactly how it's working, but it's this idea that you can only show part of where you want to mask by having two masks with the same setup, but one of them padding box just blows my mind and gives me lots of ideas on stuff we could probably do with that, which is really cool. Uh, and then there was the last one, which was Jay's. And Jay's is also, you know, look at that, it works, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, and his is actually very similar to mine. First of all, let's look at how he's doing it, where he's just deconstructing, check that out. Um, first time I see that, where we're, uh, he's deconstructing to get the X and the Y, and we see it's coming up here on the HTML, uh, one singular X and Y as well. So not a separate one for each box like Hyperplex did. So Hyperplex is alone on that one um, and similar to us in other approaches or similar to mine uh, in other approaches. And what really made me validated here was when I saw the background attachment fixed. So we did it similarly on that, which is awesome. Uh, though he did also use a card after and a card before to be able to do it, so not on the background of one of the elements. But the one thing I found really cool here was where I used, if let's go back to mine for a second. Um, I did set up like the, the background image, which is just my gradient, they would move around, right? So nothing too fancy there. 
Uh, and then I had to use a negative Z index to pull it backwards. And then with my negative Z index going backwards, I could inset it negative one to get that size difference there so I could actually see it. Where J departed and did something really cool was with this mask here. And this took me a while to understand uh, how it's working. <laughs> but basically he set his mask up. So, um, so the gradient is very similar, but let's just change this to be red. Um, so we see what's showing up here. And you just get like this red border basically around. And I was like <laughs> trying to wrap my mind around it. Basically he has a linear gradient going and it's four pixels thick is what you see here going down each side. So like if I come on this and I change this to one pixel, uh, we're gonna see that that's, that one pixel is controlling the top. And if I change this one to 10 pixels, that one probably will be, there it is on the bottom. Then these are the left and the right. So I can do this one at 20 and I can do this one over at one, just so we can see that what he's done is he has this div across the entire thing uh, and he's masked, instead of trying to hide it away by pushing it backwards or something, I think this is actually a really nice, amazing solution where he's just hiding the part we don't wanna see. And I tried doing this at one point, as I mentioned with like a, ma was it a mask? I think I, I think I tried doing it, yeah. I did it with a gradient, but I was trying to make like gradient boxes and then it was just a nightmare and I couldn't get things to align because the gaps and then the one pixel space, every, it was a disaster. And then I saw this and I'm like, oh, I guess I sort of had the right idea, but I didn't, I wouldn't even have thought of setting it up like this. Um, and even with the way this is done, like I wouldn't have created my mask this way. I would have done it. Um, actually I'll show you, we'll, I'll, I'll comment this out and I'll be back in one second. I would have thought of doing it this way instead where I'm doing like white and then transparent at starting at the very beginning. So I can do it for like down and across and then like transparent the whole way down and then having it be white at the very bottom and, and vice versa. But this is kind of awkward because then I'm dealing with percentages instead of pixels. Um, so to get it small like this would work. And so like setting it up like this wouldn't have occurred to me, though obviously it works and it's really cool. Uh, we could probably do a bigger breakdown on how this gradient is working and what exactly it's doing, but I'm gonna save that for another video, something for you to dive into and have some fun with in the meantime. Uh, or if you're just confused by what you see there, leave a comment and let me know uh, down below. But I thought it was really, really a, you know, using the mask this way so you don't have to worry about layering stuff was such a fantastic idea. And I wish I'd thought of getting it to work that way uh, instead of doing it the way I did it. Definitely some similar ideas between, you know, obviously we need to track mouse positions, uh, even though we saw it between Hyperplex and the rest of us, there was different ways of doing that. Then we need to have the outline. And I think me and Hyperplex were the closest on that in that trying to get the outline just by layering different things. And the one in the back is a little bit bigger. Uh, whereas Tamani did that other approach with like the overlapping areas by doing a mask composite and excluding stuff, which whoever knew that was possible. Uh, and then Jay, instead of doing that, used like the uh, this mask, you know, really clever mask around the sides here uh, to just, instead of worrying about layering stuff, was just masking and only showing the areas um, or the sides that we need. And I've mucked his up completely. So let's just hit refresh on that uh, to take a, a look at how um, it would actually work. So yeah, definitely in the comments, let me know which one of these approaches was your favorite one. If there's any of these that have confused you, uh, the code pens are down below so you can check them all out, play around with them. Uh, and I hope you like seeing less so exactly how I did it since you could go check out Hyperplex, really good video for that one instead, also linked in the description as I mentioned before. Um, but more of like my, how I eventually problem solve my way there and then just exploring these different ones. And let me know if you like this type of video as well, because I've never done anything like this one before. And with that, I would really like to thank my enablers of awesome, Johnny, Tim, Simon, Michael, James, and Andrew, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.